Okay, here we go. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, and NITEP uh, colloquium. <clears throat> it is really a, a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Eric Aurel uh, today, because he's, uh, he, he could be the, the perfect NITEX associate, yeah, because uh, <clears throat> uh, Eric um, studied um, at the University of Göteborg, and since 2003, he's a professor of biological physics uh, at the KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in, uh, in Stockholm, in, <clears throat> uh, in Sweden. So he's a typical, uh, as you guess from the title of his talk, that's not really biological <laughs> physics. Yeah? So he's a typical uh, interdisciplinary uh, person working across um, uh, silos of, uh, of science, <clears throat> of, basic, of, of different basic sciences. Yeah? Over the years, he has also been a, a guest professor in, in various countries, among them um, close to Sweden, in Finland, but also a little bit further away uh, in China. <clears throat> yeah, And uh, as I said, his main uh, research interest is, of course, biological physics, and mainly uh, the, the, the interaction between computational aspects and, and, and more recently also genomics. And in fact, while we were chatting before going live, he promised to give us a talk on genomics as well in the, in, in, in the near future. Yeah? Um, over the last probably just under 10 years, he got interested in, uh, uh, in, in quantum physics. Yeah? And, um, and today he's speaking about uh, uh, a very interesting question that uh, is not resolved in the title. So we will have to listen to the bitter end to find out uh, what we have to do with the, with the gravitational field. Yeah. So Eric, thank you very much uh, for being with us. And uh, while you start sharing the screen, I quickly introduce uh, Ilya uh, Sinaiski and Ying Shema who you also see on top of the panel. And um, Ilya, many of you recognize him as the standard co-host of, of these events. Uh, and Yingshe uh, knows Eric and uh, will help us, um, will help Ilya moderating the, the questions during and after the talk. So please, if you have questions, uh, use the Q&A facility and, uh, and Ilya and, and Yingshe will, will keep an eye on them. So Eric, please. Uh, if you would like to start uh, your presentation, you're welcome to, to share the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks also for this gracious invitation. It's uh, both an honor and a great pleasure to, to see you, many of you, in uh, almost live. I will start sharing the presentation now. And if just a minute, it should be in the right mode. Okay. So, uh, well, thank you again, and, and I'm very happy to give a talk about this topic. This is the first time um, I do it, as um, Francesco very correctly said. I, I am a statistical physicist by training. I've been doing mostly biological physics during my, my career. And in the last a little bit more than five years, I started to get interested in uh, in quantum problems. And uh, this is uh, um, work I've done with Igor Pikovsky, who joined um, the neighboring university, actually practically the same building as ours, uh, called Stockholm University, as an assistant professor. And he comes really from this field of quantizing gravity or understanding if gravity should be quantized. He started out in, in the group in Vienna. And I can, of course, blame him on, uh, on getting me enticed to this, but that would be both unfair and incorrect. Uh, I have been trying to un uh, talk to the field theory colleagues uh, about certain papers, which will soon show up in the slides and also were given as references in the, um, in the announcement of the talk some years. I, they are... Uh, let's say curious um, and uh, r raises your curiosity, but without being overly technical. And at least in Sweden, they seem to be uh, completely forgotten. In Finland, they are better known. I should also say this is joint work with a, a student, Eric Grydving, and there will be a link to his thesis, which you can read already now online. The paper which we are writing is still not quite finished yet. So you'll have to wait if you're interested one or two weeks for that. So with this, let me show you the first substantial slide in my talk, which is a kind of outline of history. And it starts uh, 
1933, which is quite some time ago, when Bohr and Rosenfeld, that's Leon Rosenfeld, showed that the electromagnetic field has to be quantized to be consistent with quantum mechanics applied to ordinary bodies. And that was at the time considered a very important paper. It, uh, it went against the then prevailing view um, advanced among others by, by Landau and Pyrus. And uh, in, the, in the minds, I would believe in most physicists, it settled the question uh, for a long time. And then of course, much later also quantum electrodynamics was developed as a pure, th as a true theory. But there was also, there was already quantum electrodynamics of some sort in the 1930s. There was a very important contribution by a young Russian physicist, Matvey Bronstein, who is in his PhD thesis, showed that the same Gedanken experiments advanced by, by uh, Bohr and Rosenfeld um, do not apply to the linearized quantum gravity. In fact, Bronstein also in this thesis invented linearized quantum gravity much before this was done by other people later. Then there is a long skip in a long um, uh, thing, uh, a long a period which I will not be talking about, which is the main, uh, uh, the main uh, time period from the 40s of the creation of modern quantum field theory and all its developments. And I will uh, take, uh, I will begin the story again by a paper published in 2009 by Gordon Bain and a co-author Ozawa. They published in PNAS a Gedanken experiment, which um, um, Bain had heard secondhand when he was a student in Copenhagen around 1961. It had never been published before. So it turns out that this second Bohr uh, Gedanken experiment is considerably simpler than the one that was published by Bohr and Rosenfeld. And these, uh, that, uh, the, the original argument and also Bronstein's arguments were revived by Dyson in a famous paper in 2014. Um, and there is yet one more paper by a collaboration from Vienna led by uh, Czesław Bruckner and uh, Aspelmeyer. The first author is Belenkia, Alessio Belenkia. They uh, analyzed another Gedanken experiment similar to the one on Bayman and Ozawa, and they arrived to the opposite conclusion, namely that you have to uh, quantize the linear gravitational field. So what I will be talking about is and on a non-technical level, which I hope is okay for this audience and for this uh, setting, uh, of these very early papers from 33 and implicitly the one from 36. And then I will take up the story from 2009 and 2018. And I will give our, um, that means the three of us, how we uh, uh, have tried to reconcile and decide what we think, who, who is correct, in between 2000, uh, in between Babe and Ozawa from 2009 and Valenki and co-workers from 2018. So that's the outline of my talk. And here is a very short uh, uh, summary of this famous paper from 1933. It's published in, it's written in German. It's published in the, in the proceedings of uh, the Danish Academy. And an English translation is surely known to many people who have ever read Wheeler and Zurich, the famous book on quantum theory and measurement. Uh, so there is an, a translation by, by um, Niels Bohr's last assistant, Pedersen, in that, um, in, uh, in that volume. According to Dyson, there's yet another transition, um, translation by DeWitt, which is available, but I'm not sure it's printed, but available in, in Princeton. And Bohr and Rosenfeld aim to show that if the electromagnetic field is not quantized, it would be possible to measure a test body. That means the momentum and the position of the test body better than allowed by Heisenberg uncertainty relations. And uh, that is, of course, an important uh, um, argument. If this is so, that if, if you did not have a quantized electromagnetic field, you could break the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. This would mean that quantum mechanics would not apply to ordinary bodies. And that, since we believe that it does, that's then an argument, a strong argument in favor uh, that also the electromagnetic field is quantized. Now, this paper is, is famously difficult to read. 
And I can say right away that I have not met a single person in Sweden who claims that he understands it, and very few who claim to have read it. And one obvious uh, difficulty is that it was written in the language of quantum field theory in the 1930s. And of course, there were many problems in, uh, uh, of that theory in those days, as one learns in, in courses uh, of this subject, which I guess most of us in, in the audience have had at some point. However, even though that's difficult, it can be cured by looking at the, the correct textbooks. And there is a review in Reviews of Modern Physics by, by Fermi, and uh, these things are quite helpful to understand what they mean. The major difficulty, if I may switch the screen, is um, that it's uh, based on what I would say in a modern perspective, an extraordinary complicated set of Gedanken experiments. Uh, with many mechanical springs and other um, devices that Bohr and Rosenfeld used to uh, correct for various um, errors in their imagined, that means imagined idealized experiments is another way of saying it, Ankin experiments. And I did once, uh, in one of the times when I tried to read this paper, I did a, the most stupid thing, which is I counted how many things they have. And I mean, the ingredients, they have two charged test bodies each with its compensatory body. There's a neutral test body, which does something else. There is five springs with different properties between these test bodies. There is some light signaling, and there is at least two rather complicated corrections, which are assumed to be analytically computable. So that there is, they say there is a formula. And according to legend, Bohr was uh, um, at those days having uh, famous guests, so Landau and um, Rosenfeld, of course, and Bohr seems to have been um, talking to Landau every day for three weeks on every detail of Landau's previous paper with Pyrels. Uh, and uh, Landau, of course, at that time was uh, a guest from the Soviet Union. Gamow, the famous physicist, was a refugee from the Soviet Union, was also visiting the Niels Bohr Institute at the same time. And this is uh, uh, Gamow's impression of the interaction between Bohr, who is the person on the right, and Landau, who is the person on the left. Uh, I found this in a presentation given about these, uh, this paper and this interaction from the Niels Bohr archive some years ago. Also, there's the saying in German uh, um, where Bohr is, uh, they, they spoke, of course, German uh, in between the um, uh, communicating in German, and Bohr is supposed to have said to Landau, please, please, Landau, let me have one more word, and then one more, one more, one more. So uh, it's a very complicated argument, and therefore um, I will um, say that it's a, a quite um, a service. Uh, and perhaps not so sufficiently appreciated by Gordon Bame to have published the uh, other un previously unpublished argument by, by Bohr, which is considerably easier uh, to understand. Uh, so here, just one page on Bronstein and Dyson. Uh, uh, as I already said, a theory of linearized quantum gravitational field was developed by Bronstein already very soon after this paper by, by, by Bohr Rosenfeld. He also has another paper, uh, that means the same Bronstein, where he does a variant uh, and an extension of Bohr Rosenfeld. So Bronstein certainly is one of the persons who has read and understood Bohr Rosenfeld. Um, and, but uh, among other things in his thesis, uh, he points out that uh, Boros and Fred arguments do not apply to the linearized quantum gravitational field. And one reason is that compensatory bodies of opposite charge, that means negative mass, do not exist in nature. And he also observed that, that means Bronstein also observed that a a, a kind of experiment similar to uh, the Bohr-Rosenfeld one would need to be very massive, and uh, at least in certain variants, so massive that it would be inside its gravitational radius. That observation was, as far as I know, independently made by Dyson in the paper in 2014, who starts his presentation and then, um, and then gives several examples where he imagines various uh, devices to measure a graviton. And in all cases, Dyson found that 
um, the before the experiment to uh, to find the graviton that means the quantum of the gravitational field had finished um, the experimental apparatus had to be so big and so massive and the experiment had to take such a long time that the apparatus itself had collapsed to a black hole before the experiment had finished and I, I think it's quite interesting that this uh, observation, which was made already in the 1930s, has not been made more often until Dyson made it again in 2014. Let me go on. Uh, so uh, now I will start to get a little bit more technical and I will give a uh, some, uh, uh, some, uh, some preliminary um, definitions, uh, which one has to state at some point. So Planck units will appear in this case, in this talk, I will not use the Planck time. Uh, I will use at some point the Planck, Planck length, which is very small. So it's 10 to minus 35 meters. I will use Planck mass, which is not very small. It's, uh, it's, a mic it's 20 micrograms. So it's a 20 microliter, which you can, uh, do by hand with the pipette in the biological or chemical uh, chemistry lab. And these are the three uh, fundamental scales of mass, length, and time that you can form from the three dimensional quantities, which are uh, Planck's uh, constant of action, the speed of light, and the gravitational constant. And they are particularly useful in the theory of black holes, because if you write everything in terms of these constants, the formula are much more easy to memorize. So a uh, black hole radius, so the Schwarzschild radius is two times the Planck length, which of course is extremely small, but then the mass of the black hole over the uh, Planck mass. So the reason black holes are not microscopic is that the masses are very big. And the Hawking temperature is similar. You can, uh, it's the um, energy of the, um, uh, of the, um, of the Planck mass um, over the uh, Boltzmann's constant, that's a temperature. And then you scale that by dimensionless number, which is the Planck mass divided by the mass of the black hole. And all you need to remember is there is a one over eight pi in front. So, uh, and, and all the other constants to, or expressions that you find in black holes are much more easily to, to remember and to memorize in, in the units of Planck lengths. I will also use later a, a quote, which I believe is the first published um, a statement to this effect, which has been done, which has been made by many, many physicists afterwards. Um, uh, it is natural to suppose that the Planck length determines the limit of applicability of present day notions of space and causality. So translated as you cannot measure any spatial position to better accuracy than the Planck length. This is then a new limit, um, let's say of parallel applicability to the Heisenberg uncertainty. Heisenberg uncertainty couples the uncertainty in length to the uncertainty in momentum. And this, if it's true, is an absolute uncertainty in length. And I will, we, I will use this, of course, it's been made by many, many others before. And uh, of course, the, the implied limit is way below what can be done experimentally today. But for the, uh, for the analysis of the experiments, which we will come to later, uh, I mean, Gedanken experiments, it is very helpful to have this Sakharov principle, as we have chosen to call it in the paper, which we are now writing. So let me now come to Bayem and Ozawa, the paper published in 2009. The title of the paper is Two Slit Diffraction with Highly Charged Particles. Niels Bohr's consistency argument that the electromagnetic field must be quantized. And this paper is mainly about what the title says, of course. It's about do, uh, presenting another uh, argument due to Niels Bohr, which plays the same role as the uh, Bohr-Rosenfeld um, argument and, and achieves the same result, but is much more easy to follow. And the citation which I have copied from the paper is, um, uh, is um, a private communication by Olga Pedersen, 
uh, already mentioned before, uh, to Gordon Baim, who was then a student in Copenhagen, that Niels Bohr once suggested a very simple Gedanken experiment to prove that in order to preserve the consistency of elementary quantum mechanics, the radiation field must be quantized as photons. And apparently, according to Gordon Baim, they had searched the, uh, the uh, Niels Bohr archives, which one can ha uh, have access to in in, uh, in Copenhagen, and they are, this argument cannot be found in any of the notes in the Niels Bohr archives and was never published by Niels Bohr or by anybody else before uh, done so by, by Behm and Nozawa. But then also, and that would be my uh, main use of this argument, towards the end of the paper, there is also a short half a page argument why they believe that it doesn't work for gravitation. So in that case, they, are, they arrive at the same conclusion as Bronstein and also Dyson. So in the electromagnetic version, here is a canonical uh, sketch of uh, a two-slit experiment. Uh, the new thing to the two-slit experiment is that one imagines a detector of the electric field in the plane of the, uh, of the screen um, where the slits are, far above. So there is a, a distance R, which is far to far above the screen. There sits some detector. And of course, you know, here uh, at, uh, for a long time, these were not done one by one. Uh, but here is, for instance, is a very nice, I would say, pedagogical paper to, to present that if you really do send electrons one by one so that you can measure where they are, each one of them, eventually they will build up the diffraction pattern. Uh, of course, nobody no doubts that this is so, but it's nice to show a, a picture and not a, a, an illustration. Now, if the detector, which sits there up to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, far above the, um, the, the, the screen with the two slits, if that detector can acquire which path information by measuring the far field electric field from the charge particle, so one should imagine that the, uh, the uh, wave function of the particle, uh, which starts at A, uh, splits in two parts, one wave packet, which uh, travels at speed here, given as V1 to the upper slit, and the other wave packet, which travels at speed here, given as V2 to the uh, lower slit. And then after passing through the slit, eventually the wave packets will come back and they will hit the screen where they will show the pattern at position B. So uh, when the two uh, wave packets are far apart, there is presumably a, an electric field from this charged particle as there would be from the electron which passes through the two slits. And if these fields are different, uh, um, up uh, where the detector is sitting. And if the detector can distinguish between the field um, of the wave packet going in the upper slit and the lower slit, it's of course a measurement of where the, this particle is going. So if this measurement can be made and at the same time the diffraction pattern observed, then complementarity is broken. So this is to uh, the argument uh, by Bohr is to say what is needed to that this will not happen. Okay. Of course, we do not want complementarity broken. There is an overall, there is a, there's a T, a time T written with big T, which is L over V. Uh, it's not, it's used in some places in some of the equations here. And there is, uh, there is an assumption that the um, detector really sits far up. So um, there is no light signaling possible to the detector and back to the experiment. The time of which it takes the electron or whatever it is to go through the experiment times CT, that length is less than the, uh, than the length up to the detector. If this is so, uh, then the argument goes as follows. First, Behm and Ozawa, of course, knew Bohr and uh, Rosenfeld and borrow part of the, um, of the ideas of Bohr-Rosenfeld. And that is the one of one charge body A, which can move, and a compensatory body B, which is fixed. A and B have opposite charge. 
And uh, now one can say one, one can find out what is the smallest electric field that one can determine by measuring the motion of such a, a of a body in such a detector. And that is given by uh, Heisenberg uncertainty uh, applied to A. And there is a form of this argument given by Bronstein, which is, com which is particularly transparent, but essentially this argument is due to Bohr and Rosenfeld. And so of course one can imagine that there is a smallest electric field that can be found in this way. On the other hand, the detector can get which path information if it can distinguish the electric field from the particle going through the upper or the lower slit. This is just ordinary electrostatics. And the upshot of combining these two, and uh, I will not give the, um, the, uh, the derivation is quite easy to follow actually, is that if the charge of the particle is going through the, uh, the two slits is Z times E, E as the elementary charge. So uh, then Z, which would be the ionization, if this is an atom, uh, has to be uh, larger than a uh, dimensionless number, which is one over the square, well, which is the, um, which is the uh, fine structure constant. So sorry, maybe there's a one or both. Uh, anyway, one over square root of alpha is here supposed to be a, a big, a reasonably big number. And CT over D, a, if you look here, D is the distance between the two slits and C is the uh, speed of light and T is the time it takes for the, uh, uh, for the um, particle to go from position A to position B. So this is a number bigger than one. So an electron charge E is safe by this argument, it's not possible to get which path information by using a, a detector of the electric far field of this type, which is made from a real material which obeys Heisenberg uncertainty. But a very, a very charged particle is maybe not safe. And that is the uh, argument, that is the, uh, the opening which Bohr used to give the argument which comes on the next slide. So a, a charged particle will radiate when it changes velocity at the slits. Uh, that's obvious that it's true. It's also true that one can, op, uh, one can estimate this radiation and there is a rather clear explanation in the paper. But when preparing this talk, I realized that there is a more complete discussion of this uh, Bremsstrahlung and the decoherence from the Bremsstrahlung. That's the most important thing, how the Bremsstrahlung that means the radiation which, which is given out from the particles means that the, the uh, particle going through the upper or the lower slit becomes entangled with photons escaping to infinity. So this means the, the, the wave packet going through the upper slit and the lower slit are no longer entangled with each other. And then of course you have a decoherence so you cannot really see the inf inference pattern. And that has been uh, computed, I think, quite generally by, by Francesco and his collaborator uh, Breuer already 20 years ago. So if there is any questions on how one does this, there is, you have a greater expert at home than me. So it's clear that anyway, that a charged particle, that means a larger, uh, larger value of Z will radiate more photons. And so visibility of the interference fringes hence decreases with Z. And you can do the, the estimate, which I have copied from Bayman Manozawa here, which is figure three. And you can see that it is when it would be possible for uh, the detector to acquire which path information, then the interference fringes are no longer visible because the particle, when it went through the holes, has already radiated so many photons that it has washed out the, uh, the, uh, um, the diffraction pattern. This is Bohr's argument. And then as an afterthought is the application of Bohr's argument to gravitation by Bayman Ozawa. So the argument goes very similarly, but assuming instead of a charged particle with an uh, interacting with an electrostatic field, one takes a massive particle interacting with the gravitational field, 
there will be a um, an idea of a gravitational field detector and this gravitational field detector will be able to acquire which path information if it can um, distinguish well enough between the gravitational field of the particle going through the upper slit and the lower slit. And uh, one turns down the, the cranks and uh, one sees that in fact, it is possible according to this one, uh, this setup to acquire which path information if the mass of the particle is larger than the Planck mass times the dimensionless number, which is how far away is the, is the detector which we of course assume to be larger than L, right? From the beginning and L is usually in a two slit experiment larger than D. So R over D is a large number usually. So uh, it is possible if the mass going through the two slits is considerably larger than the blank mass. However, in that case, the fringes are at the separation which is less than the blank length. And that's done by estimating the um, h bar over mv. Of course, it's the de Broglie wavelength and, and the geometry of the situation. And assuming then there's, there was the assumption in the beginning that r is larger than ct. So one gets that the distance between two fringes is less than the Planck length. And so a quantized gravitational field, of course, would, would perhaps do the job, but it's not necessary by this argument. It suffices to apply Sakharov's principle and to assume that the Planck length is a lower limit on position measurements. Now I move to the next paper 10 years later, not so long ago. Uh, and this paper got the first prize in the assay, uh, essay contest of the Gravitation Foundation in the same year. There's also a short version of the paper available uh, uh, on archive and published. Uh, it has a long list, of, uh, a longer list of authors. Balenkia, Alessio Balenkia is a, a young, I guess he's a student or a postdoc. And the two um, senior authors are, are Jasla Bruckner and Aspelmeyer. And this, I should also say, is part of a modern trend of tabletop experiments in quantum gravity, where there have been several very highly cited papers and very influential ones, just to cite a few of them. Bose and collaborators um, in uh, PRL in 2017, Marletto and Vedral, the same year, same journal, a paper by Rovelli, who was a very well-known relativist. And uh, the latest I found, well cited in this is published in, uh, which kind of a, almost a mini survey is from the same group, at least there's an overlapping group as the one in the first paper of Bose et al. So it comes in the same, uh, in the same tradition to uh, use modern techniques and ideas, or let's say at least concepts from quantum information to argue the similar things. And so here uh, one starts by having two, um, it's not two particles and a detector, a particle detector. There is an Alice and a Bob. And Alice has prepared a particle way back in the distant past, which is in a, in a superposition of two spatially separated states. They are at distance small d from each other, these two states. They can also be, um, um, the distance can be entangled with the spin degree of freedom and internal degree of freedom, which is similar to the setups in, in uh, Vedral and in Bose. There is also a Bob and Bob has a particle in a box and Bob can choose at some point to release the uh, particle in the box or not to release it. Um, now, at the end of the experiment, Alice has the goal of bringing the two states together to a pure state. Uh, and if she does that, uh, she should see some kind of interference pattern. Um, and that is then the question if she will or if she will not. Now, uh, when, uh, when Bob releases his particle, it will entangle with Alice's particles. And if it entangle, if Alice could then bring back the pure state by doing uh, suitably moving the wave packets of her two particles back together again, this would go against complementarity. Okay. But if, um, 
but if Alice could not bring back the pure state, and if Alice and Bob are spatially separated, which is the same uh, uh, distance requirement as was in the previous talk, although here expressed in a, in a distance called D and not R, then Bob can effectively send one bit of information faster than light. So it seems that there is a paradox, either causality, that means relativity, or complementarity, that means um, uh, quantum mechanics is broken. Is this true or not? And of course, the goal of this paper of Valencia and collaborators is to prove that, well, there is no paradox because one can assume that the uh, uh, electromagnetic field or the gravitational field are quantized and that solves the problem, which is correct, but it's not the only solution as we will see. So in the electrodynamic uh, case, in fact, is quite similar to the analysis of Bayman Ozawa. They said it uses slightly different um, uh, uh, different ways of stating the uh, the errors in in which uh, you have, but you can also check if uh, and and we have checked that it actually is there using the same Bohr and felt derived uncertainty relations. So so the outcome is that if Alice's particle has too small effective dipole, and the effective dipole stems from the difference in the field from a source that is in a superposition at two different positions. A real dipole would be the difference between two real sources then the, um, with two different charges. So uh, when Alice's particle has the too small effective dipole, Bob will not get which path information. And when Alice's particle has strong enough di effective dipole, then he could get which path information. But then Alice's particle also in this case, by a similar analysis in Bayman and Ozawa, would send out photons when the two states are brought back together. And so then um, there is no paradox if the electromagnetic field is quantized, more or less in the same way as, uh, as in Bayman and Ozawa. In the gravitational case, uh, Malenkia and collaborators arrive at the, um, uh, at the conclusion um, um, that they also need uh, a quantization of gravitational field uh, to avoid the paradox. Um, is this true or not is the question. Here comes the argument in favor. So there is also a technical point that Balenkia uh, uh, correctly point out that there is no effective gravitational dipole from Alice because the center of mass on Alice's side is unchanged. So if Alice moves her test particle to the right, then her lab and herself presumably move to the left and vice versa. So the two states are not really Alice's particle to the left and to the right, is Alice to the left and her particle to the right, oh, sorry, her lab to the right, the lab is presumably much more massive than the particle, but still there is some small shift or the opposite. And you can see, you can work out that in this case, the difference, uh, the acceleration that you have is proportional to um, the mass uh, at Alice's side. That means this is, the, this is what's felt by Bob, the distance between the two positions and it's inversely uh, proportional to the fourth power of the distance. And then there's a prefactor, which is the split of the two positions, small d over big D. Okay, so Bob can only acquire in this case, which path information if the effective quadrupole in this case is strong enough. And you can rewrite, the simplest way to rewrite it is uh, that the, uh, in fact, they write it somewhere that the the uh, quadrupole moment uh, defined as the mass of Alice's particle, the distance of the two separations, has to be larger than the Planck mass times the distance of between the two, um, between Alice and Bob squared. There is this prefactor within parentheses, small d over big D, which is not in there. It's a dimensionless number, but presumably the, it's a small number. Hence, uh, it, it is possible for Bob to acquire which path information here if either, let's say, in a given geometrical setup, if his mass is large enough, and in particularly uh, quite a bit larger than the Planck mass. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and this quadruple changes as um, uh, as Alice brings her two uh, her, her two uh, the wave packets together, and the change in the quadrupole is a source of gravitational waves, which then also gives photons if it if the gravitational field is quantized. So a quantized gravitational field also solves uh, and avoids the paradox in this case. So if the gravitational field is quantized, it's also not possible to acquire which path information from a very massive particle. However, this particle is, let's say, with a reasonable um, scale, let's say, that one can imagine that uh, small d can be one micron and big D can be one meter, uh, then actually the mass here would be uh, um, about 10 tons which is about 10,000 kilos. So that's quite a lot. It's a really a big thing to ask for an experimentalist to prepare two pieces of matter of 10,000 kilos each, which are in a um, um, coherent state with spatially separation one micron from one from the other. And you can play with other numbers, of course and you can get sooner. So it is a, a rather serious, uh, serious effect. And it has also this, uh, this effect, which apparently was not considered. You, can, you, um, you should also check for the interference fringes for Alice. Can she actually observe any interference of her two particles? And they, you don't have to assume that in this case that they are 10,000 kilos each, but they could be, they should be at least uh, on the order of Planck mass or larger. And you can check that the interference fringes in this case have to be less than the Planck length again. And they have in the argument as given in the paper, they have to be less than the Planck length with your prefactor, which is D over D. And if you do the correction, you find that it's D square over big D squared. So again, in this case, if Bob acquires which path information, the interference fringes are so close, closely spaced to be observed by Alice. And in fact, by a larger margin than in the argument of Bayem and Ozawa, which is essentially due to Bohr. So it's not necessary to have quantized gravitational field to resolve the paradox. And now I have a few slides just to round up. This is the main story. So the first one is, what does it mean? Of course, I am not really sure. Um, first one has to point out that an absence of an argument in favor of a thesis is not an argument for the antithesis of the thesis. So that this uh, argument by Balenki et al, that it does not seem to work, this is of course not an argument against quantization of gravity. That one has to keep in mind. Uh, then if you check up, uh, check out uh, Wikipedia, which is the invaluable source of, of, uh, of wisdom and knowledge for all of us. Um, the first Gedanken experiment in physics was uh, by Galileo in the famous experiment uh, when he dropped the weights from the Tower of Pisa because it was likely never done in reality. It's uh, the source is Discorsi e Dimostrazioni Matematiche, which means uh, um, which means uh, lectures and proofs in mathematics. Uh, and so says Wikipedia. I'm sure Francesco will be able to say if this is correct or not. As far as I remember, in Pisa, he was in Florence, and Pisa and Florence were not in very good terms at the time. So I think it's quite possible that it was just a figure of speech. The term was coined by Ersted, the famous Danish um, experimental physicist in the beginning of the 19th century. And the most famous modern users of Gedanken experiments are, of course, Einstein and Bohr. So one negative conclusion is maybe that the Gedanken experiments are inherently difficult. And uh, so difficult for ordinary people, and so it's maybe left to other people. And quantum gravity is a notoriously difficult subject. So the combination may be difficult squared. That could be a negative uh, conclusion. A speculative conclusion, which is maybe more exciting, uh, of course, I have absolutely no argument in favor, is that perhaps the difficulty of constructing a Bohr-Rosenfeld-like argument, even of the simpler type of the, the, the Bohr unpublished-like argument for the quantization of the gravitational field points to that if gravity is quantum, 
it doesn't have to be quantized as a quantum field theory, whatever that means. But these are not uh, speculations. So one should keep in mind that, or not only speculations, that these things do have connections to reality. In the bigger picture, black holes have been observed. We now know that they exist. We have seen them, we have photos of them. And uh, if there are objects in our universe, they should be described by quantum mechanics. So indeed, if they are not quantum objects, this will lead to Hawking's information paradox and problems for quantum mechanics. So it actually is important for things that we know exist in the university uh, if and how gravity is quantized. And with this, I thank you. And uh, I have on the last slide, uh, first, what you have heard is mainly the outcome of a master thesis at my university by a student, Eric Rydbing. I am not sure he is on the talk, but uh, he was invited. He might be in the audience. In that case, he could also ask questions. And we're writing up a paper together with their exclusive co-supervisor, Igor Pikovsky. So my, uh, my thanks are first and foremost to Eric and Pikovsky, but I also showed the slide that if somebody in the audience is really interested and wants to read something now, the thesis is available uh, on the, um, the website of my university and uh, it can be downloaded and, and the arguments can be, uh, can be checked in advance. You will find most of the calculation there. I hope that convinced you that there are interesting questions in reviving quite old considerations and also that some of these can be addressed with rather simple tools. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Uh, it's really very nice to, to, to see the, 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 the discussion on, uh, on the possible quantization of the gravitational field in the historical context. And, and thank you for explaining so nicely this uh, classic uh, uh, um, thought experiments that um, that are really powerful. <laughs> no, thank you very much. In the right hands, one should say maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, now yes, there are thirty participants. Yeah. Do any harm. Yeah. <laughs> at least they don't do any harm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so can I ask Julia and Yingshe if uh, to guide us through the question session, and maybe Yingshe and Ilya would like to start. Maybe I well, should say the also that both Igor and uh, I checked now. Both uh, Igor and Eric are in the um, uh, in the uh, audience, so it would be nice if they could also be unmuted. And uh, in, yeah, uh, for some yes, questions, can, they can surely they know surely more than me, so that we yeah, could all yeah, and, that would be nice. Perfect. So they are all uh, unmuted, and they are welcome to to give us their their, their comments. Hi, yes, Igor please. And, and mm -hmm. I, Okay. Okay, I, I saw there was a question asked uh, for a link to the thesis so that he can download and then he's, he see you give a link, thanks. Okay, I, I, I believe this is uh, yeah. already answered. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I actually have some questions, but uh, let's see what the audience have, uh, would have uh, some question I would uh, take audience first. Um, or oh, oh, um, Yingxie, before maybe you start with your question, should we give Igor and Eric the, the possibility to, to make a comment as well? Okay, also, yeah. okay uh, great. Yeah, yeah, that would please. be nice. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm not sure if you can see me. I'll just say hello. Uh, hello, oh, I'm not sure if I have a, have a camera, but um, yes, well, thanks yeah. Eric for presenting our work. But um, other than that, um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Igor. Yeah, I'm here as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Eric. It was very nice to hear it from you as well. You uh, took a, uh, a slightly different uh, point of view than my, my, my own presentation, but it was very interesting to see it with your words. Thank you. OK, so now we, you, all three of us can answer questions, I hope. Yep. OK. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and maybe, I see... Maybe Camille can ask his question, because I, I allowed him to talk. Okay, okay Camille. Camille. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, thank you for, for this interesting talk. I, I have a, 
kind of basic question, uh, which is related to to the Planck length. And so, uh, uh, as you as you said, and as is uh, usually uh, assumed, uh, nothing can be measured below this uh, Planck length. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering why. What is the argument uh, behind behind this limit? Uh, okay, so others can surely say more, but I believe there are many arguments. There, there are arguments if gravity is quantized as a quantum field theory, if this that would be so, then it would follow as a consequence that you could not uh, measure things, positions to greater accuracy than the Planck length. Um, now, um, I believe there's this German, uh, sorry, this Indian fellow who has... Uh, made also papers in the in the essay competitions for the Gravitation Foundation. For instance, there is a nice review by um, Sabine Hossenfelder on um, uh, different um, scenarios for minimum length. Um, let's say uh, uh, Sakharov in, uh, in, in that paper, which is the first one uh, uh, where I have seen that, that statement made doesn't really uh, give any argument. He says that this seems reasonable. Uh, and I, then I think there is a whole zoo of explanations on, on the type that you would assume that the, uh, on smaller length scales, you can have, um, uh, you can have virtual creations of, of uh, let's say very small black holes, let's say, and they can come in and out of existence. I'm sure there are many more than I know. Maybe I can add okay, a very brief you. comment, yes, yes. if I may. Yeah. Uh, uh, a different way of answering it, I, I think one can just take the very conservative agnostic view to say, look, we don't know what's happening at the Planck scale of beyond. Um, and there's so many different, uh, there's so many different uh, um, possibilities, oh, sorry, something is happening here to my Zoom, but uh, uh, what I'm saying is there's so many different um, possibilities or speculation, but uh, one can just take the agnostic view to say, look, uh, we, we just make predictions until the Planck length and not beyond. And so anything that hits the Planck length or below, uh, maybe we say, okay, with current physical understanding, maybe it's too uh, dangerous to make uh, predictions any further. And so it's not necessary to say there is some break off, but rather just say, okay, this is maybe the applicability limit of what we know today and beyond that is speculation. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, it makes sense, yes. Uh, I see Thomas uh, raise his hand. Thomas, please. Yes, hello. Uh, so thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the experiments that uh, that one could do, and I think Aspelmeyer, Markus Aspelmeyer, was one of the persons that wanted to do such experiments uh, to uh, to confirm that gravity is quantized by showing that um, if you have a superposition, uh, if you have a, a mass in the superposition uh, at uh, two uh, places, uh, and there is another mass, then uh, somehow um, uh, this would lead to a situation where the two masses are entangled due to gravity, right? So yeah, yes, the question yeah. is, do you know anything about how, um, how feasible these experiments are or whether, whether there is any progress in, uh, with these experiments? Okay, these are uh, different questions in one where I know the, let's say there are three questions in one, I would say I know a bit about the two first, but I think I have to leave the, the third one to Igor. So first one is, uh, you can make out the math here, right? Uh, especially nice is the kind of experiments where you have interactions between um, two uh, particles, each of them, which is split into uh, two wave packets which are in spatial, so you have like four particles, actually only two, but each of the two are in two separated states. And so then you have the, um, you get a phase shift of the wave function, uh, which is different if you have the uh, right, 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 left, left, right, or left, left combination of the wave packets. 
And for this, you can do an elementary calculation. So you can say if they are the two things are on one kilometer away, and uh, if they are so like the LIGO, and if they are um, if they are the, the split is one meter, uh, it's enough that you have this position happening in about one second, and then you should be able to see a, a phase shift uh, between these different four components, and those you can. You can then um, use to measure entanglement between the, the two different positions. That's, a, that's the basic idea of the Bose, uh, um, the Bose paper. So these, uh, um, it's essentially using the extreme smallness of, of Planck's constant. These things do not look absolutely impossible. Uh, we had a report by Aspelmeyer here in Stockholm two years ago at the conference I or uh, organized. And at that time, it was a work in progress. They were saying, we think it can probably be done, but we are quite far from, uh, from actually having it done yet. I mean, the specs are not, it's not doable as the experiments yet. Now, there was a conference, I believe, uh, last week uh, online where Igor maybe participated. So he might know what's happened in the last, uh, let's say, uh, last half year or year or something, if anything more has happened. Thank you. Yeah. If Igor is still there, he had some problem. Uh, sure, I'm here. Um, no, I was, I guess I was upgraded to a panelist. So uh, that was the problem. Um, well, no, I, I, I think maybe again, only a general remark is such experiments are kind of decades away, if not beyond, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a 50 year time scale, 30 year, something like that. So it's a very, very challenging long-term holy grail to you know have sufficiently large masses in sufficiently big superposition but but there are new ideas maybe how to make it easier yeah but but it's not something around the corner thanks okay great and i see uh, william horowitz uh, raise his hand william please yeah. uh super thank you so um if i could sort of summarize the chain of logic the way that i'm thinking about it uh, if to then lead to the question that I have. So I, I think the chain of logic is, if you postulate that X and P don't commute, then you necessarily get that Heisenberg uncertainty. And so if you can cook up some kind of experiment that breaks Heisenberg uncertainty, then you're breaking the postulate that X and P don't commute. Um, and so that would be sort of this fundamental breaking of quantum mechanics. But I get, so I guess my first question is, is that sort of the right way to think about it? And then if so, what is it that, why is it that we require that X and P not commute? So what is it, I recognize that that is a postulate, fundamental postulate of quantum mechanics that we, we elevate the Poisson bracket to uh, a commutator and say that it's equal to I H bar, but uh, could we perhaps live in a universe where, where that is not the postulate? You know, is it what, what necessarily breaks if we say that X and P maybe do commute? Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so the first part of the, um, um, of the question, first question, I would say yes, although that's not the way these papers are written, especially not Balenki et al, which places a lot of stress of causality and, uh, and, and you know, space-like distances and signaling and so on. But I think this is the, the, the what you pointed out is the central part. Uh, so, uh, and that's the, uh, that's the gist of the argument that if you do not quantize for the electromagnetic field, then you will break Heisenberg uncertainty for ordinary bodies. Uh, so, uh, and then the question is, do you, is there such an argument also for the gravitation field? And for the moment, there is not. Uh, then the second one, uh, well, what would be a word without quantum mechanics? I think the, the, the pioneers of quantum mechanics wrote about this quite extensively. If I'm not mistaken, you can find something in Schrodinger's What is Life uh, from 1944. Uh, so the stability of matter depends on, on, on quantum mechanics. Um, um, life depends uh, mostly on, uh, on chemical bonds and stability of chemical bonds. The possibility of, of um, having uh, a, um, 
what Schrodinger called an aperiodic crystal, so proteins and DNA and the genetic uh, uh, source code of us. So uh, if uh, we were living in a non-quantum world, uh, we would probably not, be, we would almost surely not be here in the form we are and perhaps also intelligent life would be impossible, life at least. So there would be many, many, many changes if we are, live in a classical world. I'm sorry, maybe let me follow up. So, you know, let's keep, for example, that one, so obviously Bell's inequality occurs. And so we know that, you know, one has to interpret things as a problem. So we understand that the underlying physics is probabilistic. There is such a thing as a quantum state that lives in a Hilbert space, so on and so forth. Uh, and that things evolved from the Schrodinger uh, equation, but, um, you know, and, and so therefore things are operators and we require that operators are self, essentially self adjoint so on and so forth. But what if I just remove that X and P don't commute? What happens then? Thank you. I never thought about it. I don't know. So you mean that there should be some other word where X and P are commuting numbers? I'm sure somebody thought about it and has a short answer. Um, maybe somebody. Maybe I can chirp in briefly. Yes. I, I don't know. I don't want to take over, but uh, of course I you did, can. I mean, th th so I did think about it a bit because there's another class of uh, models of, of quantum gravity, in fact, speculative models, which postulate a change in the commutation relation, a little bit like uh, what you're saying. Um, it's something like scales, maybe with a system size where the commutation relation changes, except they uh, postulate the opposite way that the commutator doesn't necessarily vanish, but rather grows or changes. So there are some questions about whether the commutator has to be constant. But if we were just to put it to zero at some scale, uh, I mean, there's, there's two, uh, of course, physical uh, consequences immediately. One is the uncertainty principle, obviously. So you can measure certain quantities simultaneously. Um, and, you know, if you do it, it's effectively classical. But if you, if you interact with another system, which is quantum and where you have commutation relations, then you can break um, uh, signaling uh, or, or other, um, uh, you, you create other problems, like instantaneous communication. Uh, and the other is, of course, dynamic uh, answer, namely that the commutator is also directly responsible for dynamics. So just putting it to zero is not also exactly the classical way. It would be a Poisson bracket rather. And so, so it's a little tricky. So you cannot just you know, make, make observables commute and preserve the structure as we know of the theory. Okay. Uh, Uh, does that answer your question, William? Uh, I need to think about it a bit more. I'm especially sort of tentative about the, the causality question. Uh, so certainly when you're at space-like separations, the commutator is zero and the basis of quantum theory is that, I guess if you're within the light cone, then the commutator is not zero. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I guess my question is to sort of crystallize it what's a measurable consequence of making X and P either commute better than they do or just to make them completely commute? And so is there something that, some experiment that has been done that clearly demonstrates that X and P have to not commute? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, um, I think we all know about, um, um, or more or less accurately, it depends on how close you are to the topic on experiments in quantum optics in having in trying to to construct states which uh, which fulfill the the Heisenberg uncertainty as as well as one likes. And I think there are well known trade offs that if you make it more precise in in one in X say in coherent states, it will have a larger spread in P. Now this. Uh, I, I am, after all, a biophysicist, a biological physicist, so I am not really conversant with the classical uh, literature on quantum optics, but I believe that these things must have been st studied uh, to quite great detail and probably can be followed up from uh, the book of Harosh, for instance, which has, I don't remember all of it in, 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 in by heart, but it has a lot of material in these directions on the foundations of, 
of, of quantum mechanics and how they are reflected in, in quantum optics. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think uh, we are a bit over now. I, I myself still have a, a three brief questions, but I want to check with Chair Francesco whether I'm allowed. No. Uh, to, yeah. Otherwise, you can Chair, always ask them to ahead. me later. We know each other, yeah, but okay, but please. Yeah, uh, so for, first, I mean, it's a quick question. Eric, you, you show the image of black hole and how does that to do with the quantum gravity? How, how was your uh, uh, insightful comments? I, I didn't follow. I mean, that could be completely classical, right? Um, the, no, the image. If, if, the, uh, if the black hole, is, well, let's say there is a lot of evidence that black holes exist and they have become more and more concrete over time. So, so let's say, you know, at some point one could say there are theoretical constructs, uh, then one could say there are indirect evidence, then one can see one can see gravitational waves from them, one can see how stars move them. Now there's even a photo of them. Of course, it is of the accretion disk, of course, but still uh, uh, of the right size and everything. So there are definitely these objects in the universe which are black holes. And, and black holes, if they do not obey quantum mechanics, if you can treat the motion of particles in black holes as the motion of quantum particles in a background of curved space, which is Hawking's calculation, then you end up with Hawking's information paradox and you will break quantum mechanics. So unless these objects are quantum mechanical, then of course you have, uh, you, you have a problem with quantum mechanics. Yeah, and so that was the point really to say that uh, the question if, if or um, uh, if, you could argue otherwise that quantum mechanics is really very, uh, it, it doesn't matter for these, um, uh, for, uh, for the scales of, of that, that quantum gravity can never be observed. Well, uh, in black holes, are observed and small black holes should um, change and should eventually explode according to the end of the hot Hawking radiation. So these are observable consequences eventually. I don't think any ex black hole explosions have been seen because they're not really strong enough, uh, but well, maybe they will. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add one comment. I mean, that, that's exactly what Martin Fries proposed in 1970s. That mm -hmm. the easiest way to see black hole is through its final stage of evaporation, yeah. which will produce uh, uh, something called a burst. And he predicts that that will really reach a high luminosity event in astrophysically. And he has some other magnitude estimation of that. But uh, yeah, there is uh, also was... one already in uh, in Hawking's first uh, paper in Nature, uh, called Black right. Hole Explosions. But uh, surely it was made more precise afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think if, if uh, uh, just a second thing, very quick, you show there's a, a nice cartoon of Langdao and uh, uh, and Bohr, uh, Niels Bohr, and there was some, some seemed to be uh, uh, like some uh, uh, bondage of Langdao seemed to of be course. like, uh, uh, what, what, what was that? What, what, what ah, that? okay. But I mean, the, the, all of this was uh, a, a, a sketch um, associating to certain practices of uh, certain state organs of the Soviet Union, oh. which, uh, which at the time uh, uh, were uh, known under the acronym of NKVD. And uh, of course, as well known that uh, Landau uh, in 1938 was uh, arrested and, um, and was uh, uh, kept in, in prison for more than half a year and uh, charged to be a Japanese and a Polish spy and, and was eventually let out. Um, unfortunately, Bronstein, who was, a, a, I believe, a childhood friend or, or at least a, a friend of, of Landau, he was not let out. So. He was also arrested in 1938, but he was shot. And I think it's interesting from a social, uh, social uh, history point of view that this was so well known in this uh, group of people around Bohr. Gamma, of course, had left the Soviet Union that they could even joke about it. And they say, no, oh. Bohr is treating poor Landau like, um, like you know, being questioned by, by the secret police. That I is see. that that I think is what they but and it shows I think the social 
the knowledge uh, in the, that social environment at the time, which is early 30s. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for your explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Francesco, please. Yeah, then, um, uh, then it's my pleasant duty to, to thank Eric and, uh, and his team, Igor and uh, the other Eric. <laughs> I just realized there are two Eric, sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry, for, for the really nice, uh, uh, an interesting presentation that uh, I'm sure will induce many Gedanken experiments in all participants over the next uh, days and weeks and years maybe. And, um, and let's see what it, what it leads to. Yeah, but anyway, Eric, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> uh, I'm really looking forward also to your biology talk that, that, that you promised us. And, and we will start uh, scheduling it maybe for after your European holidays, yeah, because uh, we are approaching our winter, <laughs> our winter holiday. Yes, thanks a lot That's for the invitation. It it's, uh, it's always a challenge, but both a pleasure and it was very useful to me to, um, have no, thank you very much. To, it was a to read it up. Talk and uh, you heard from the questions that uh, it was interesting to not just to me, to many people. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you'll stay with us for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Then uh, a good evening. Since we're all in the same time zone, a good evening uh, to you as well. And uh, and we will stay in touch and um, and we'll organize other talks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Good evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Yingsha and Ilya, for your help. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for all thank the you. questions, Bye. too.